today, but hopefully um, they will get some sun rays uh, during the day. Uh, but yeah, so first we have uh, Jennifer Cabrelli. Uh, she is coming to us from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, she is the Associate Professor of Hispanic and Italian Studies. Um, she does phonetically driven phonology research, which is super fascinating to me. I feel like we have some sort of a utility-based approach theme running through. Uh, through this mini conference. Um, but yeah, she's a uh, young but a very prolific uh, author and professor. And uh, I'm just going to uh, let her take it over with her uh, talk title of Trisha and Third Language Acquisition. So let's give her a little. Uh... Well, thank you all for having me today. And I'm excited to start off my little extended stay here um, talking about one of my favorite topics, which we know is third language acquisition and what I've been really in, most interested in um, for the better part of, I guess, a decade at this point, which is attrition in third language acquisition. So just to give a brief, um, I don't know if it's, this isn't working, but that's okay, because I can use this, right? Yeah, oh, there it is. Okay. You just have to have the cursor in the thing. Okay. So just a brief um, roadmap for today. So of course, if we're going to be talking about attrition in third language acquisition, we have to talk about what we know about L1 attrition, because just with all of the research we do in L3 attrition, especially at the beginning, it is very highly informed by what we know in a bilingual context to take as, you know, kind of to get the um, hit the ground running with L3 stuff. And then once I've kind of established what we know in L1 attrition and how that might inform our research in L3 acquisition and attrition, I'm gonna talk about L3 influence on an L1 versus an L2. Why this actually is interesting to me at least and to some of my colleagues, what we want to know more about and what we know or don't know um, is more like it at this point and how then we can make some progress in this line of inquiry, building methodological and theoretical frameworks borrowing from the L1 attrition playbook and then coupling that with considerations that are going to be specific to the field of third language acquisition. So before I get into anything, we have to come up with a working definition of attrition. And this is something that is very much not widely agreed upon by anyone. And so I've purposely chosen the broadest definition, um, which is adopted from Schmidt and Kupka, specific to L3 attrition here. So all L1 and L2 phenomena that stem from the co-activation of languages, cross linguistic linguistic transfer or disuse at any stage of L3 development and use. So when I said broad, I mean really broad. So essentially any changes that happen to an L1 and an L2 in the process of L3 acquisition. So starting with um, L1 attrition. So attrition is a universal phenomenon. I think that this is something that is essentially accepted at this point, and it is said to be a logical outcome of bilingualism. Why? Because there is typically in most cases, a decrease in L1 use, and there are now shared processing resources spread between the L1 and L2. And the effects that we see can be related to representation and accessibility, and we've seen them span production data, processing data, and comprehension data. Now, um, when we talk about L1 attrition, we need to talk about whether effects are processing or structurally based, and then I'm gonna talk briefly about what we know about lexical attrition, morphosyntactic attrition, phonetic and phonological attrition, which are the three types of attrition that have been most widely studied, and then a little bit about the extra linguistic predictors. And again, this is going to set the foundation for what we talk about when I get into the L3 stuff. Now, first starting, uh, start talking about processing versus structural effects. So the idea is, is that people are still trying to figure out when we talk about attrition, is it affecting processing? Is it affecting representation? Is it both? How do we know? This has actually been referred to as the black box of attrition research, something that just has not been figured out yet. And what um, 
Schmidt and Deleu have said is that, you know, where these effects lie in relation to one another on this idea of this continuum, like I said, it's the black box, we don't know. But the idea is instead of splitting this into a binary thing, is it processing or is it structural? It probably is instead something that is a little more continuous um, and nebulous. However, if we look at the data that's available to us, the observed effects seem to reflect decreased L1 processing efficiency and coactivation. So we know for sure it's happening at the level of processing, but the open questions that we have are, does this online attrition, attrition actually yield structural change over time? Do you have to see online effects before you can see structural effects? And is grammatical restructuring even possible? Now, we're going to start with lexical attrition and then move into morphosyntactic and phonetic and phonological. Um, and the, this idea of structural uh, grammatical restructuring will play more of a role in the morphosyntactic uh, attrition literature. But starting with L1 lexical attrition, why? Because it's the most widely researched aspect of attrition. I think it's the one that nobody is going to argue with. Um, as to whether or not it happens. It's been posited to be the first module of grammar to attrite. Um, and it's said to occur because there are changes in L1 lexical access. This is gonna result from coactivation with the L2 and the competition that results. And the attrition tends to manifest in forms of disfluency, reduced lexical accuracy, diversity. We've probably all experienced some form of this um, as bilinguals and multilinguals. Um, at one point or another. Now, when we talk about attrition effects, they seem to be modulated by L1 and L2 frequency of words, by the similarity between L1 and L2 words, and they've also been found to be mitigated by L1 use for professional purposes. Remember I said I was gonna talk about extra linguistic factors. This is one example of that, right? So it's not just all linguistic internal, and there are going to be a number of factors that can modulate the severity or degree of attrition. Now, like I had said before, L1 morphosyntactic attrition is a little bit trickier, it's a little sticky, um, but there seems to be general agreement that language internal and language external interface domains are vulnerable to L2 influence. This is, you know, part of the interface hypothesis idea that this is coming from a result of limited processing resources that are needed for online integration of these internal and external um, interfaces. Now, general agreement there, a lot less consensus when we're talking about the status of language internal syntactic knowledge. Can that actually attrite? So there are a number of researchers that have shown that syntactic knowledge is stable. Most of this comes from behavioral um, methodologies, although this latest paper by um, Gruder and Hopp comes from eye tracking data. And then there's also some evidence that syntactic knowledge is in fact vulnerable to instability. Again, mostly behavioral methods with the exception of the Kasparian et al. paper, which is um, based on ERP data. So the question is, all right, why is this going to be different than lexical attrition, or as we'll see, phon phonetic and phonological attrition, why might it be so highly constrained? Well, it seems to be that this is because typically grammaticality is more or less categorical. And so this is something that's going to be constrained to situations where the L1 and the L2 are structurally similar languages, an L2 property that we're looking at has an L2 analog with shared featural configurations that aren't exactly identical and in contexts where there is consistent coactivation of the L1 and L2, again, that being an extra linguistic um, factor. So that's the story with L1 morphosyntactic attrition. Now, when it comes to phonetic and phonological attrition, we have a couple of different flavors. So there's phonetic attrition. This is said to come in the form of long-term subphonemic changes. So think about voice onset time, things of that nature. And then there's even phonetic drift, which are short-term changes that are due to recent L2 exposure. Now, where is the line between phonetic drift and phonetic attrition? I don't know. I was mentioning to Jason that my Fulbright student asked Monica Schmidt this question last month and she said, who cares? So, um, yeah, again, it's all on this continuum. Now, in terms of phonological attrition, this is also thought to be a long-term change, although again, anyway, that's up for debate. But this is something that we're gonna see effects of crossing a phonemic boundary, yielding a phonemic merger or some sort of contrast neutralization, or realizing a difference in um, an allophonic alternation.
This is something we've seen can affect consonants, vowels and their spatial distribution, prosody, global accent, kind of the whole shebang, right? Um, it's something that is often documented in um, L2 development, usually due to what is thought to be a novelty effect or the new challenges that come with inhibiting um, your L2. Um, it can also be something that reduces or stabilizes over time. And most of the evidence that we have for this particular type of attrition um, comes from production data. Now, when we switch over to L1 phonological attrition, there is some evidence of stability of phonological representations at the segmental level as well as the supersegmental level, but there's also quite a bit of evidence of instability. Again, this is something that is hitting across vowels, consonants, phonological alternations, and um, even phonotactics. Um, and then with the phonological data, we tend to have more of a balanced mix of production and perception data. And again, all of this type of data, things like this, these are going to become important when we're making choices in our L3 research. Then finally, we have our extra linguistic factors. This is not even an exhaustive list, but this is a list of the primary um, factors that have been found to modulate in some way or another the degree of attrition. So to nobody's surprise, things like L1 and L2, input and usage, proficiency, their learning context, are they an immersion context or in a classroom context, how long they've been um, living in the L2. And then we also have a bunch of other individual differences at the metacognitive and social affective level. Now, what I think is probably going to be the most realistic situation is that there are actual clusters of factors, right? None of these are, um, acting in isolation, right? It probably is a mix of several of these that are going to drive what we see in attrition. So that is just, you know, a quick overview of what is happening um, in L1 attrition. And so now we can kind of move on to attrition and L3 acquisition. So I'm going to talk first about, like I said, what do we want to know? Why is this interesting? What do we know so far? And then I'll move into some methodological considerations. And then finally, just a couple of ideas about how we might want to then model theoretically um, attrition in L3 acquisition. So starting here, what we know from the get-go is that an L3 can affect an L1 or an L2 in a facilitative or a non-facilitative way. We have non-facilitative um, effects on an L1, on an L2, on an L1 and an L2. And then we also have um, evidence of facilitative effects on an L2. So we know that this can happen. And so the fact that these are possible outcomes leads us to a couple of different research questions that have um, kind of come to the forefront of this line of inquiry. So the first primary right research question, this is one I'm not gonna spend too much time on um, because I'm frankly a little more interested in the second one, but this is also interesting. This question is, all right, let's say somebody has learned something, they've learned a third language, they've acquired a particular phenomenon, and it turns out that this phenomenon presents exactly in the way that it does in the L2, but the learner never actually acquired that property in the L2. Is this something that could have a trickle down effect, right? And so kind of like a knock on um, or gang effect on the L2 and actually facilitate um, L2 acquisition. And then the second question is, when a learner has two existing systems and they've acquired an L3, what are the variables that are going to determine any differential effects that that L3 is going to have on a learner's L1 versus their L2? So um, going first into the first research question, um, there hasn't been a ton of research done, and that's why I just kind of put it in this nice little neat table. Um, but we can see that it has been looked at um, across different modules of grammar, although very clearly the majority of the work has been done um, in L3 morphosyntax. And in the context, there's been a lot of research done, especially um, in Hong Kong and mainland China, um, looking at L3 effects on the L2, usually a Romance language or German affecting L2 English. Um, and we can see that there has been a facilitative effect um, in all of those studies with the exception of Chuang 2002. Lexical, there's one study that has shown a facilitative effect. And in phonology, we have one case where it was facilitative and the other case in which it would remain neutral. So the fact is we don't know a ton, but it seems promising that this is a thing 
um, that happens. And so the logical question from there is, well, what has to take place for this to happen? Is this something where someone has to go live in the L3 for 10 years? Um, no. And this is something that then says there's there's things that can help um, classroom learning and curricular planning because facilitation does not seem to be confined to high L3 proficiency, long-term L3 immersion, or even closely related languages. This is something that we have seen happen in low levels of L3 proficiency. We've seen it happen in less than one year of immersion, and we've seen it happen in typologically distant languages, right? Where L3 Mandarin positively um, influenced L2 English. And so looking at this type of question has particular implications for classroom learning, and it can further inform the benefits of multilingualism. So you can say, yeah, every time I learn a new language, is there potentially interference with my L2? Yes, but it can also be helping me. Now, the second research question, again, this is my favorite, when a learner has two existing systems, what are the variables that are determining how that L3 affects each of those languages? And this question is of interest because comparing L3 effects on an L1 versus an L2 can tell us about the constitutional differences in systems um, that are acquired at different ages or that have differences in dominance um, in terms of stability, right? So you might be able to acquire a language um, that is a native-like system, but how stable is it once you have acquired it? And um, I've looked at this primarily in terms of age of acquisition, right? So is an early acquired system more stable than a late acquired system? But more recently, there have been um, some investigations into whether your language that is more dominant is um, less affected. And then global structural similarity, right? So if the L3 is more similar to the L1 or L2, do we see greater effects? Um, so this question has been primarily looked at through phonological effects, but there are a few studies of lexical attrition and one study of morphosyntax that I'm going to be um, referencing here. So starting with age of acquisition, Again, is the degree of an L3 effect greater on a language acquired as an adult? Um, in my dissertation work, we presented the phonological permeability hypothesis, which has since morphed into the differential stability hypothesis because I started looking at things other than phonology. I was interested in, okay, if it works like this in phonology, how does it work in other modules of grammar? Um, and this just states that an early acquired language, so language acquired in childhood is less vulnerable to instability than a language acquired in adulthood. And this is the assumption that when I'm talking about a language acquired in adulthood, it's not just intermediate proficiency. We're talking about near native um, levels. And there was a strong version, which is that this would happen at the level of representation, and a weak version, which is that it would be limited to processing. Now, there are some data that align with the hypothesis that show that the degree of the effect is greater on the L2. Um, this has been shown for phonology and for the lexicon, as well as for morphosyntax. But then, of course, there are quite a few um, data sets that don't align with the hypothesis, which is that the degree of the L3 effect is either greater on the L1 or there's simply no difference um, between the L1 and L2. They are affected equally. Um, and this has been found for phonology um, in production data as well as phonology in perception data um, and in some lexical access data. Now, most recently, um, looking at global structural similarity, there's the research question of whether an L3 is going to have a greater effect on a more similar language. And Megan Brown and Charles Chang just put forth this year the similarity convergence hypothesis, which is stating exactly that, right? So an L3 is going to affect the more similar language to a greater um, degree. So they looked at L3 Spanish effects on German and English speech rhythm, looking at mirror image bilinguals, right? So L1 um, German, L2 English, L1 English, L2 German, learning L3 Spanish, and they reported greater L3 effects on English, regardless of whether it was the L1 or L2, right? So this is something that is essentially the inverse of what we have looked at, looking at initial stages transfer in L3 acquisition right, um, looking at these same different variables. And then in terms of dominance, 
This is the question of whether an L3 is going to have a greater effect on a speaker's less dominant language. Now, this is something that I have started working on recently. It is very much a work in progress. Um, of course, looking at L3 Portuguese effects on L1 or L2 Spanish to the surprise of no one. Um, and the way that I have been looking at this in terms of dominance is I have the mirror image groups that we are used to seeing, right? So the L1 Spanish, L2 English, and L1 English, and L2 Spanish. Um, but by adding in a group of heritage speakers of Spanish that happen to be dominant in English, we're able to tease apart Spanish age of acquisition from dominance. Because what we can see here is that the heritage speaker group patterns with the L2 Spanish group in terms of their dominance, but it patterns with the L1 Spanish group in terms of their age of acquisition. So based on the way the groups pattern together, we can then determine whether it is dominance um, that affects um, effects on the L1 or L2 or age of acquisition. Now, the sad part is, is that the results of this study that I've been doing on verbal fluency and on global accent ratings was no, no effects. There is individual variation, which is very interesting, but absolutely nothing that would indicate that either age of acquisition or dominance um, are differentially or you know, responsible for effects on an L1 or L2. Now, I will say that this was done after one semester of L3 instruction, right? So we tested them at the onset of L3 Portuguese acquisition before they'd even stepped in the classroom, and then again, 16 weeks later. So this was minimal exposure. Um, and so what I can say is that my takeaway from this so far is that, well, at least now we know that we're not going to find the effects that we're looking for probably in one semester of classroom instruction. And so we need to think differently when we're talking about how to best design a study to capture attrition effects. So with that in mind, we want to talk about how to move this forward. This is very much still an exploratory question. Both of them are. There are a small number of studies. They vary widely <laughs> along several dimensions. And there are a large number of outstanding questions that we can address going forward. So one of these is, at what points in development and what levels of proficiency does an L3 actually influence existing systems? Two, are all modules of grammar affected similarly? Three, does L3 influence occur at the level of representation or is it limited to processing? And finally, D, can L3 effects be reversed? Um, I mean, the spoiler alert is yes, um, at least if they are affecting processing. Um, and then finally, what are the roles of cognitive and affective individual differences? So these are all kind of outstanding questions that we wanna think about moving forward. And if we are going to pursue all of these questions in addition to the big research questions, we have to establish a common methodological framework and address how we're actually going to you know, model these dynamic developmental processes. Now, Schmidt and Kopka talking specifically about L1 attrition, they made this call for theoretically motivated research that embraces linguistic, psycholinguistic, and sociolinguistic approaches. Um, and so that is what I am talking about um, attempting here. And specifically, what we need to do is start by taking the existing L1 research and what we know to address the relevant empirical and theoretical considerations. So empirically speaking, like I said, the goal is going to be a, you know, establish as common a possible methodological framework so that we can be comparing apples to apples across studies. We have a lot of things to come to an agreement on. And then theoretically, modeling these processes that explain not just what, but also the how and why. So going beyond description, making testable predictions, um, et cetera. So I'm going to talk a little bit about methodological considerations first. Um, first, talking about sample and design, a little bit about individual differences, and then getting into context, phenomena, and modality, and specifically, what do we need to take from L1 attrition research when we are designing this research? So starting with sample and design, if we wanna look at age of acquisition, as we do with initial L3 transfer, we need to have those mirror image sequential bilingual groups, right? So bilingual speakers of language A 
and language B. And then if we want to include dominance in the mix, we have to put together a design like what I mentioned before, right? In addition to those mirror image groups, we wanna have a group that acquired one of the background languages as a heritage language that happens to be dominant in the non-heritage language. Again, so that the heritage group will pattern with one of the mirror image groups if <clears throat> in terms of dominance and the other mirror image group in terms of age of acquisition. Now, if we want to add global structural similarity into the mix, then we have to select a language triad such that the L3 is very clearly more similar to one or the other background language. Now, how do you do that? This is my Achilles heel. Everybody that has worked with me knows this determining what is language distance? How do we quantify language distance? Is, you know, that is years in advance, right? That I, someday, someday we'll figure it out. But so for now I'm saying, you know, Portuguese, Spanish, English, I feel like people aren't going to argue too strongly that Portuguese and Spanish are not more similar than, um, Portuguese and English. Now, when it comes to longitudinal versus cross-sectional observation, everybody knows cross-sectional is just logistically easier, right? But there are many problems with it in the best of cases and in L3 acquisition, especially if we're looking at development, it is a nightmare. Um, we want to avoid cross-sectional designs and why? Because these learners are coming to the L3 process already with heterogeneous representations Yes, in the L1, but even more so in the L2. We know how much variability there is in L2 outcomes. So we cannot rely on cross-sectional research and expect that everybody looked the same in their L2 at the onset of L3 acquisition. So we want to instead opt for the harder route, right? And then maybe that's why there are so few studies done so far, um, which is to opt for these longitudinal designs. And specifically, we have to document learners L1 and L2 baseline prior to L3 onset. And we need to do this for two reasons. One, we have to make sure that they have acquired whatever we are looking at in the L2, right? They have to have something to lose or something to change. And then we can use their own data to compare to them over time. Um, yes, we can do group level analysis, but I think that with this kind of work, the individual data is what is really going to tell us um, what is going on here. And talking more about individual data, moving into the idea of individual differences. So again, if we're looking at changes over time, we need to be measuring at every single time point, not just the first time that we test them, but every single time point, especially if they're in an immersion situation or in and out of an immersion situation, um, which is a case that I have been confronted with before, um, their proficiency, their dominance, the social effective factors, which again can change over time and the cognitive factors, such as relative co-activation, which again is going to change even from um, moment to moment. Um, now, one of the key things about this, right, because this thing here, yeah, let's measure all these things. Yeah, no problem. But the problem is we have to operationalize these, right? What is proficiency? What is dominance? What is language distance. Um, and so we have to come together as a field and at least come up with a working oper operationalization. And then as we do that, establish valid and reliable measures of these key constructs once again, so that we can compare across studies. We're not going to have the number of studies, we're not gonna have the number of data sets to work with that L2 acquisition research is going to, right? So we really need to make sure that there is some agreement um, across studies. And then finally, context, phenomena, modality, essentially what do we need to consider when we are designing these studies in terms of what we know about L1 um, attrition research. So I say that since all of this is super exploratory, we know our resources are very limited. And so we don't wanna waste any time, money, energy, um, just to get some sort of null result. So let's maximize the likelihood that attrition will obtain. We wanna make sure we are doing everything we can 
to capture actual attrition. So this is where we rely on the L1 attrition research when we're selecting certain elements. We go and we find, to the extent that we can, language pairs where we have seen attrition um, attested. Linguistic contexts, we're probably going to want to focus on immersion context. You saw what happened in my classroom research. Um, choose linguistic phenomena where we have seen um, attrition and then use instruments and modalities that again have captured attrition. So what is the risk of not doing this? Well, if attrition doesn't obtain, we're not going to know why. We're not gonna know if it's because their systems are actually resilient to stability, instability rather, or if it's just a consequence of the design, right? So we're essentially stacking the deck in our favor um, by considering this um, with our design. So again, linguistic context, we have greater evidence of attrition in immersion context where the L3 is going to be highly activated. This is no surprise. Um, and as a matter of fact, we just don't have any evidence of attrition in an L3 classroom context, not just in the study that I talked about that I'm working on, but in any of them. Um, in terms of phenomena, well-studied linguistic phenomena that are shown to be vulnerable to L1 attrition. So in phonology, just for example, vowel quality and voice onset time, like those are slam dunks, okay? Morphosyntax, interface phenomena, I'm not going to try and look at some core syntactic property when there isn't even a, you know, consensus on whether it is vulnerable to attrition. Um, and then relying on instruments and modalities where we see demonstrated reliability in the detection of attrition. So again, we know that I'm always talking about phonology, explicit perception tasks, um, accent de detection tasks, um, there have been some other things that have been, you know, grammaticality judgment tasks where we tend to see these um, effects play out, et cetera. And then finally, once we have all the data, how are we going to actually model what's happening, right? So moving beyond description, of course, that's the first part, but then we want to actually figure out how to model this. So when we look at, again, pulling from L1 attrition research, what can we take from there as a starting point? So if we look at L1 attrition models, and there's an actually, you know, the handbook of language attrition that came out in 2019 has an entire section just on all of the different models that have been proposed. It's an excellent overview for anyone that's interested. And if you look at them all together, you see that while they might um, consider individual differences to different levels, every one of them has some sort of formal component and some form of uh, processing component. But of course, how those materialize differs across um, the model. Now, if we look at this, um, say, this uh, quote from McWinney, which is from his um, chapter on the competition model as applies to L1 attrition, he claims no single process model is ever going to be sufficient to account for the observed phenomena in language attrition. So a full account is going to require further detail regarding social and motivational inputs, contextual changes, internal processing mechanisms, and neurological foundations of plasticity and reorganization. So if we're talking about attrition, ideally we want to be encompassing all of that. So the competition model does attempt to account for all of those things, as do the um, complex dynamic systems theory and Mogul, the modular online growth and use of language, which I know several of you are here um, are familiar with. Now, all of these models can be applied to L1 and L2 attrition more generally, but we would still need to stipulate the factors that are going to predict and the mechanisms that are going to explain any observed L1 versus L2 differences. Right? So we can take one of these models as a point of departure, but we still need to account for other things. Now, there is one model that has accounted for attrition in the context specifically of multilingualism. This is the dynamic model of multilingualism. Um, it is envisioned in terms of the application of complex dynamic systems theory. It does encompass linguistic, metacognitive, and social effective factors. And it follows the assumption that attrition as well as acquisition processes are driven by whatever the multilingual speaker's current communicative needs are. Um, now, 
The issue with this then, right, we could start with something like this. However, again, it treats the L1 and L2 similarly, and it makes no predictions for L1 versus L2. So what I am proposing moving forward is that we can take elements of these existing accounts of attrition and multilingualism, such as the dynamic model of multilingualism, together with the types of um, hypotheses that I talked about earlier. So the phonological permeability hypothesis, the structural, um, is it structural convergence hypothesis, similarity convergence hypothesis, um, where we can essentially integrate these to come up with a more um, exhaustive model. So the ideal account, again, is going to specify the how behind the developmental processes and also strike a balance, as I said before, between these fine brain descriptions that are really going to be what tells us what's happening, as well as testing falsifiable predictions to figure out why. Um, so just to wrap up, so we know, and you've seen here, that there are some growing pains methodologically. Um, and in the handbook chapter on attrition and all three multilingualism um, that I wrote, I go into that in a lot more detail. Um, so despite these growing pains, I think that we can consider this small body of L3 attrition research to serve as sort of a proof of concept. Like this is worth pursuing further, and we have some evidence of that. Um, but we still have a lot to figure out when it comes to what are the variables that condition attrition, what are the underlying mechanisms involved, what are the extent and permanence of attrition effects, and we can work towards these, as I've said several times already, by capitalizing on L1 attrition theory and methods together with the relevant best practices that we're currently using in um, L3 research. And that's it. We have um, quite a lot of time for questions, so please shoot them. Mark here. Hi, Jen. Thank you very much for the really nice overview. So when I was like listening to your talk, I was thinking about the project with the Loy mm -hmm. and the development yeah. of the L3. But then now that I looked at your research, it was, you know, at the initial stages, it might be fine. But if there's when we're looking at development of L3 and there's also an effect of L3 to the L2, and we're looking at how the L2 to L3 changes too, right? So mm -hmm. there's this like bi-directional influence that's really hard to kind of, yeah, like capture because how do I know whether, you know, when I'm applying my L3, I'm kind of overcoming the influence of L2 if L2 is changing as well, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how do you think we should go about with this? Because now it's exactly what we're looking at. We're looking at Japanese, English, and then uh, Spanish. Mm -hmm. And obviously English and Spanish are quite similar and Japanese people have more um, instability in English. So right. like, and then we see an initial transfer from English to Spanish, but we're looking at development and if we want to look at kind of your hypothesis with L3 development and how, you know, like you have to have less dominance to overcome that influence. But if L2 is changing as well as a result of L3, I'm just like, right. Trying to figure yeah, out I mean, and again, we have limited resources, but if I had unlimited resources and time, I would just say as dense of data collection as you possibly can to the extent possible, but then of course, we're also risking familiarization with tasks and all of that stuff. But, you know, testing them at periodic intervals over time in the L1, L2, and L3 to see if you can capture some of those dynamic changes over time. Yeah. Um, but yes, I understand what you're saying, right? So you're like, well, they're gonna take longer to get to actually converge on the L3 yeah. and then we have to, I mean, the idea is that you wouldn't probably start, look, I wouldn't start looking at the changes to the L2 and the L1 until I've seen that they've acquired accurately the L3, right? So I would probably be like focusing on the developmental question that you guys are looking at now. And then once they do converge on the L3 target, then, you know, find that point at which they are converge and then yeah. see what it what the other systems look like yeah. does that make sense yeah i mean it's tricky though you have to be like analyzing the data as you go 
Yeah, yeah. Even the like elementary development thing is like hard yes, enough. Right, right. Yes. So it's really difficult to even think about from L3 the other way around, even like if we don't know what the development process look is going to look. And that's the thing too, right? Is we know so little about development at this point. Um, and so yeah, we're kind of a lot of this is kind of flying blind. And so that's why the idea is, okay, let's just follow what we know as much as possible to at least control for what we can, and then hopefully learn yeah. something along the way. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's really cool. But I'd love to talk to you about it more. Yeah. That's exciting. <laughs> Mark? I have a kind of similar question, but it's not about nutrition. It's about, um, well, you show you, um, you uh, mentioned a study that wasn't your study, but where there was in fact facilitation from mm -hmm. the L3 to the L2. The L3 was Mandarin and the L2 was English. Mm -hmm. And my question is, how do we know that they didn't have any new input in English during that time while they were learning Mandarin? I mean, yeah. English is everywhere. So it's, mm -hmm. this is going to be especially hard when yes. the L2 you is have to English, be. right? Yeah. Um, because that could have simply been from Ambient, yeah. input and use of, mm -hmm. of English was that actually controlled for and that's, that's you know I'd have to go back and look at that but you that is an excellent point and I think that's one of the things that I was getting at like at every time point we need to be evaluating you know proficiency and dominance and part of the dominance would then be where are you getting your input from what is the quantity of input you're receiving in all of your languages at that time point because I think you're absolutely right that that could be a case and the L2 is almost always going to be English, yeah. right? Exactly. <laughs> Unless so you're in the US the or the UK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, and so I think for that type of question, then the logical thing to do then would be to try and find a situation such as, you know, L1 English, L2 something else, and then L3 something else where we can better control what the L2 input is at that time. Yeah, or yeah. a situation where you're immersed in the L3 and you know that you're not using the, the L2, L2 at all. At all. But, yeah. yeah. Again, it's like the logistic nightmare. I just, we just need to create a colony, right? Where we can just go put people for a while and in any case, IRB is approval really, would be as free. Yeah. Can I mention something that? I mean, I think you could conceive of a way multiple ways that you can approach that. Of course, that's correct, right? But, um, you know, and I don't know the study at all, right? So, you know, if somebody, it depends on the individual, because for example, if it's somebody who is L1 Mandarin, well, let's say L1 Spanish, L2 English, since they're five, they populate the study starting when they're 20. So they've had 15 years of English. And after three months, all of a sudden, something changes in their English. Chances are, I think it would be a little more convincing to say, okay, there is something going on here. Another way to approach that would be to have multiple L3s compared where you can expect that this could affect English where this one couldn't. And then look at people who are in relatively the same context, right? So, you know, it's not just about measuring, but it's about kind of juxtaposing the likelihoods of something. Yeah. You have, say, something that you think Spanish will affect English, but French wouldn't. You look at them from the onset of their French or their Italian. Again, people who are native speakers of mm -hmm. Spanish and have had the same 15 years and they're at the same schools in Madrid and, you know, whatever. I think there's a way that you could, and I hope, and in that study that's published, and we look that there's some type of factor about yeah. that, and it's not just people in midstream development, mm -hmm. and then they're looked at after. So I think you could, I don't think that's insurmountable. I think it's very possible, uh, but I don't think it's insurmountable, because what would explain a three-month shift after 15 years yeah. of knowing a language? And I, if I'm recalling correctly, so I think that this one was L1... Cantonese, no, L1 Korean. It was L1 Korean, L2 English, L3 Mandarin. And so, yes, they had been in mainland China for one year. And so my guess is if they were L1 Korean, L2 English, that they had had English since, since they were six, six or seven. seven. Yeah. yeah, so that's a, a good point. But yeah, there's some fun stuff that we could do with design to figure that out. Yes. Can I, maybe it's even making a little bit of a plug for starting somewhere in the general program, because I think having seen this, first of all, really good talk, and it was really nice because I should know more of the nutrition, and I don't, right? I kind of ignore it as, you know, you 
You know, you know why, okay? So, um, but the whole thing taken together and now thinking about the parallel universe of 15, 20 years of looking at um, the L3 itself, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, I wonder if this speaks to the importance, not only of longitudinalness, but where you start in the process. Because, and this is stemming also from what Maki said, if it's the case that things turn out, that everything in the mix turns out to be moving targets all the time, then if you take a snapshot from any period of time, your snapshot is potentially already changed, such that if something looks like an L2 or something looks like an L1, that could be reflecting, depending on the context and where you're testing people and their exposures, that could be the moving target anyway. The only way you can know, and for independent reasons, I've argued this for a very long time, starting from the very beginning is super important because of all these other extraneous things. So my concern when I read, when I look at all of this, is exactly what Maki brought up that I don't think she was getting to, which is, in all of the studies that have looked at things past a beginning stage, and if you see convergence or non-convergence or whatever, and let's admit the literature is growing and it's growing, getting more diverse, and, and, and therefore things don't neatly fit the boxes, so to speak. What if some of that is noise that we're injecting because we don't know what the relative baseline changes themselves have been? So yes, for a longitudinal, which we know is difficult to do, but not impossible. But I'd like to make a case that when you bring this together, with the other side of L3 research, that this, for me anyway, my interpretation adds uh, to highlight the importance of when you start in the middle, you just don't know where the beginning was, right? And so um, this makes me a little even more nervous about trying to interpret, and, and, and the obligation, the feeling that we have to explain everything so that you have to take all the literature that starts from the beginning, the middle, somewhat advanced, eight years of English, and you're first looking at something. Um, because if it's so dynamic, that's difficult to capture, right? You, you just don't know. You, you make a lot of, I think we make a lot of assumptions about what the L1 and the L2 is, even if we test it. But what, you, what this attrition research is telling us is when you test it, you don't know if that hasn't already changed, right? Um, and that's both interesting and head scratching and troublesome, but that's why we do this research to find the troubles and then go back to the beginning and say, this means that, okay, you have to start over or something. So I'd like to say starting from the beginning is a very good place to start to quote Julie Andrews. Yeah, well, I mean, ideally, with this type of design, you can cover all of the big research questions, right? So initial transfer, which I am like starting to get away from because it is just, I, I, I'm never going to figure it out, right? But that, and then this idea of after initial transfer, how do you overcome non-facilitative transfer? And then once you do, how does that affect your existing systems? If you can do all of those questions, Again, this is something that we need money and time for. Um, so if anyone's interested in collaborating. Can I just yeah. say too, it bodes nicely, I may not have a few other covers. You know, it bodes nicely with this kind of trade-off approach to, you know, kind of trying to fuse the language side and the cognitive side of bilingualism and maybe understanding that there are trade-offs. Trade-offs could be, okay, bilinguals have uh, potentially less uh, lexical diversity, but the trade-off might be something else. And the idea here is that you have finite resources. So when you see uh, something you might interpret as an advantage or something in one domain, you probably should expect that that comes at a cost of something else. In this context, I think this encapsulates it very well to say, and therefore say what I think maybe is it controversial, but maybe is to say that attrition and acquisition are not different things no. anyway. They are just part of this trade-off system. And it's a far, and, and now just language, and probably cognitively dependent, but you know, there's a, a trade-off. And as such, these things can't be or shouldn't be divided out as if they are separate processes, because now you see the interconnectivity. And in fact, not just the interconnectivity, but the consequences for the methods we are applying when we're taking our snapshots and then the So anyway, very nice. Sorry. Mara, you had something? <laughs> no. I mean I completely agree that we should start at the beginning because that's when we typically 
well, you're more likely to see an influence from you know, on the L3 from the previously acquired languages. Um, but of course, if you want to see <laughs> attrition, you know, if you just want to see the other direction, that you probably need to look. It's the longitudinal nature, right? Really look at yeah. Yeah, but if you, you start longitudinal cards, so that you want you want to see uh, attrition, it's going to take some time before yeah. before it affects. That. Yeah, so it's so a, maybe maybe depends. looking at immersion situations right. is yes. is what we what we need to do and, and move away from from the classroom, classroom stuff. Uh, absolutely, because, but and and there are things. Because then you the time of, of right. Yeah. But you, yeah, but there will and then we're not necessarily looking at probably structural effects. It's probably all you know, epiphenomenal things that are happening at, at that point. But you know, like somebody was saying something about this the other day. Like, well, wouldn't that take a long time? Well, Charles Chang did his dissertation in L two Korean, and they had study abroad students in Korea. And after six weeks, their voice onset time had changed in English, and they were not using substantial English at the time. Um, and then there's other thing, you know, studies of lexical attrition where they've seen changes in lexical access after just a few weeks of immersion. So I think it's, again, like picking and choosing what we decide to look at so that, you know, at least at the beginning, while we're trying to get our feet about us, looking at things where, okay, we don't have to invest three years of time for what might not actually turn into anything. Let's see, okay, let's like shoot for phonetic drift and lexical access to start and then, or even the, you know, production data. So the case study from my dissertation, his perception was pristine, nothing changed in 12 weeks, but his production changed so much in that time. And this person had, you know, was a near native speaker of L2 Spanish, had lived in Spain for two years, was in Brazil for six weeks after a six week uh, classroom experience. And when I was playing his Spanish interview data for Jason, he was like, I thought his Portuguese was better than that. And I was like, that's his Spanish. I mean, it had changed so drastically in that time. So like you said, immersion is, and he was a special case, I think. I don't think everybody um, changes that much, but. Okay, so there's a sacrifice that you have to be willing to make. Because if you do something longitudinally, you have to be realistic about the longitudinal temporal period of that, right? And you have two questions. You want to know what happens, but you also want to be able to talk about stability of that. Mm -hmm. and one of your possibilities was that it can go like this. Yeah. And as in your case study, we won't say who it is, that person no longer uses Portuguese and their Spanish is back, back to, base to where it was, yeah. right? So we already know it. And that's work. in also in like morphosyntactic judgments as yeah. well as so, so the question system. becomes if you, what's a reasonable longitudinal study for immersion if we we're prioritizing getting them at the beginning a year to whatever yet yeah, yes you can probably find some people who are longer but will you capture them right you don't have 15 years to do so so you might have to you might need cross-sectional studies and understand what they are um, for questions of this going up and down and matching the variables as best as you can. Or having people who, you know, come back from something and looking at what is it that, but then again, unless you caught them before they went away. Uh, but you could do this, right? Just a year immersion, you do before, you do middle, after, and then a year later, and you can look at those things to see. But maybe in that context, it wasn't enough time for that to become stable in the first place because it was only a year of immersion. So I think there's some issues in terms of when you will have to be okay with um, some cross-sectional tolerance for certain types of questions, because I'm not so sure that the real world reality will allow you to look at all of the things you want to look like in a way that you would be comfortable with because I know you very well and say yes this is you know um so there maybe is a little room for some cross section well, right. if, you, if you say so then it's <laughs> fine but it's like thinking about the reviewers you know and if I were a reviewer I'd be reading that and say mm, I don't know what you can say about this but if you have the longitudinal data to complement I think that that is a well, yeah, database is like the no we there's the there's like the some people in the Norwegian database that was done in the 50s and then 
40 years later, but were there their parents and stuff, or yeah. immigrants or whatever. So there might be some resourcing to think about in terms of archiving people tested with decades. It's not L3, this is then, you know, attrition per se, but you know, yeah. there's, it's complex, is the point. Yeah. About the trade offs. Is there any study that looks at, you know, if you could? So I think this was mentioned by Monica at some point, but like there's some trade off in attrition, rate of attrition, and rate of acquisition. So if you uh, can acquire a boundary to a greater extent, then you're more open to change as to say with your L1 and L2. Are there any studies like this? Because I've is that what you mean by trade-off, Jason? Is, or is that something that you mean? Not necessarily. I mean really trade-off in terms of, you know, it could be a cognitive trade -off for a linguistic one or a linguistic one for a cognitive. The, the point is that we don't know what the sum total is, but it will equal zero, and any movement in one direction would assume. This, what Jen is talking about, I take as internal to linguistics. But I think I understand what you're saying. So, like looking at different like proficiencies of L3 to or, see how yeah, vulnerable like, their I system is in general. If that, yeah, this could also tackle that question of whether you know if you if you acquire if like looking at basically individual differences in, in L3 acquisition versus L1 and L2 attrition, you could do this from the data if we have this longitudinal thing mm -hmm. and looking at okay maybe people who are um, who, acquire, who can acquire maybe some certain grammatical structure, whatever it is, in the L3, maybe they're also, there's a trade-off in their L1 and L2, where if they're more open to change in their L1 and L2, so they're flexible, actually, yeah. yeah, so I thought maybe... I mean, that's kind of like, like, uh, Alicia's dissertation talks about that a little bit too, right? Like if your L1, depending on like how flexible you are in your L1 is, you know, determines in part how successful you are in your L2. Is that kind of? Yeah, maybe, yeah. All right, well, there's work from Judy Crow. They look at like an L1, L2, and then um, how good you are at acquiring L2 affects like how flexible like, your L1 is. And basically, you are more prone to attract in L1. Yeah, I but issue with this type of research in general because it's self-selecting by the participants so when you look at these existing studies and right, they're well-intentioned and very well done studies but they look at people who are very highly proficient right in the l2 and that's potentially not everybody so you're really looking at the map the people who whatever and it might be the case that those individuals are more flexible, but it doesn't necessarily mean that all people who are flexible, if you tested right. everybody, would achieve that level because that's already self-selecting. So I think that it's a reasonable question and the correlation can exist, but we also have to ask ourselves who are included in these studies. These are extremely proficient L2 learners. Should we conclude from that that they all happen to be mentally flexible for their L1 to, to be understood as if you have flexibility, you will achieve that, or are they just a subset yeah, of the well, this is the question that we had? We don't know that. Yeah, it's like a good chicken and the egg. To, so. With this development data, if there's, you know, if you know the initial stage of time, really, how yeah. that, then you can really answer that question, right? Yeah, you need 15 well, years. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard because I think for our study, like when we looked at development, we just tested the Portuguese people because we were like, we want them to come back. If we say you have to do it in L1, L2, L3, mm -hmm. that's going to be like, a, we already lost like half of the participants yes. in the time two data. So mm -hmm. that's another thing. Right. It's got to be nutrition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Longitude always seems easy because it's conceptually easy and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but like you just know, stick a nightmare. We've, you know, I'm almost 20 years on my career, right? And I remember in the first couple of years, you know, we need longitudinal data for heritage speakers to really understand whatever. If I had done that, because now it's 20 years, which seemed an impossibility when I first said this, right? We would have it. But where would I get the funding? How are these people going to stay in the study? I mean, like, you know, I mean, it's just inconceivable, yet the most conceivable approach to actually get at the question. So now, what do we do? Right? Um, and, and some marriage between them um, is probably the most realistic, realistic. way to do it.
right? It is done in other fields, you know, in health, medicine, there are longitudinal yeah. studies. So it's a matter of convincing the uh, funding bodies to the feasibility and the value of the longitudinal studies in the way that it should be done in real life, right? Yeah. So we are limited to what the funding bodies give us, which is the best is five years, right? And then given the design and everything, it's not even five years in reality. So there's, there's such specificity to this too, because you yeah. have options to join these studies. For example, in Norway, and Northern Norway in particular, has a yeah. uh, population study, whatever. And we look into adding some, because they're scanning people. So we just wanted the, the brain scan that we had for, where is it? I mean, it's a, it's a long time, it's like 30, 40 years, right? So if we could get them, because they, they do the scans, you know, iteratively, to add a bilingualism questionnaire now, we can even try it retrospectively with the people in there. Sure, well, $50,000 to buy in to add the, you know, whatever, if you need that. And then it this the two, two, three questions, you, you can't ask what, so, you know, these types of studies, when you look at these really long medical studies, they sacrifice detail for, for 50,000 people, which then they're going to collapse together. So for the granularity of what we do, that might be quite difficult to do, right? Um, uh, not just from funding bodies' perspective, but to get people to do these types of things, which is different than filling out a questionnaire about your eating habits or whatever, run into the hospital, collect your couple hundred euros, and get your brain scanned, and now you also know, because legally we have to tell you if there's... We have to send it to a radiologist who then contacts you. It's also a free MRI, um, you know, every couple of years. So, you know, doing that, I think when we when you look at these very big cohort studies, the level of detail, and there's lots of departments involved in this. So the anthropology has a couple of questions, this, this, and that. I don't know if we'd be able to, we wouldn't be able to be like, oh, and we'll need about two hours to test the language, <laughs> test the languages. So, you know, with great number comes the perception and real power in terms of our statistical analyses, but then there's the threshold of what people can talk. How do you motivate thousands of people to tolerate hours and hours of the detailed testing that we want? Especially when, you know, I have permission to pay the participants $10 an hour, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, at least we can do a lot of this stuff. You know, one good thing that's come out of COVID is that, you know, people are more respectful of online data collection in the field. And I think that that's something that we will have a better chance of longitudinal work if we don't have to bring them into the lab every time. That's the other, at least in Chicago, I mean, there's no parking, they don't want to come. <laughs> Thanks, guys. This was very helpful. Thanks so much. So now we have like um, an hour for lunch. So um, the food should arrive shortly. Yeah, um, check. Maybe it's outside. Oh, okay, actually, yeah, I'll go check. So technically, we can eat here, or we can all convene in the in the. There's maybe a little bit of this. So. Yeah. 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 Alex, do you want me to end the meeting or just leave it open? Um, I will pause it. Okay.